Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here's your host, Joe Kuzma and Zach Celedonia. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Joe Kuzma, and joining me along for the ride here as we get close to 10 days away from the 2023 NFL Draft, a one Zach Celedonia, the Flash, my brother from another mother, and all kinds of different things. I almost didn't recognize you today, man. You got like, I was thinking, I'm surprised we haven't heard any of this from our, our followers and listeners yet, but I was thinking, I was like, uh, well, now I think Encino, man, but that might be predating you. But ho- like one of these unemployed hockey guys, like with the pens or something like that, everybody's going to be like clean house with the Steelers too, right? <laughs> How's it going, man? The practice squad player. <laughs> now you look the part, man. You got the, you got the Steelers shirt on at least. And we usually don't see you with the hair. He's letting his hair down right now. So. Yeah, Monday's a, Monday's a wash day. So I shampoo, condition, brush it out. I feel your pain, man. I mean, maybe I'm going to start, you know, I, I thought about uh, my, my, my daughter, my nine-year-old daughter, she gets on me. I'm like, should I shave this? Should I use some just for men? I mean, it's the only hair I got is what's on my face. I, like there's a little bit on my head. I didn't shave, I didn't shave the skull. And that's because I was out, I was coaching her soccer team and the sun, the sun's on my bald head, even going back to Easter, even like they start to peel a little bit cause it's too pasty. Like I got to get, I got to get conditioned back into the sunlight weather. Although. There's no sunlight where I'm at right now. I don't know if it's cold, rainy, and like 40s where you are too. But yeah, it's just, today it's. Oh man, it went from like 80s to absolute like crap. <laughs> like I don't have anything else to say. We got some like we got a little bit of breaking news. One of it broke. Like I, I always hate this, but myself and Brian uh, did that show. It was late, like I think Thursday night. We ended up doing the show, and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna put the. I'm gonna put this out Friday morning. Um, uh, nothing, nothing's going to happen, whatever. And then Bud Dupree signs one year deal, 5 billion with the Atlanta Falcons and totally screws the pooch on a per on what was a perfect episode of, you know, us talking about how edge rusher wasn't going to be important. So we might have to revisit that. I had already had this earmarked for us to talk about the secondary and DBs and we'll have a few miscellaneous topics, but for the most part, it still seems like the edge rusher visits and whatnot. It, it's not any top guys. So it doesn't really screw up like the way we thought maybe the Steelers may be operating for this upcoming draft and uh, just kind of get your thoughts on it. Is it, does it tick you off any of that Bud didn't sign? I kind of thought at 30 years old, there was a rumor out there that he wanted a two year uh, Steelers were going to give him a two year deal. And he only wanted a one, like approve it that he could stay healthy, still play at a high level and then go cash in somewhere else. But I'd make him 31 somewhere else. I just think that right now the Steelers are probably very forthcoming and he understood from the way it worked, even when he came in, that he was going to be a backup, like a role player type, uh, a contributor. And regardless of the money or the length of contract, I think he wanted to go somewhere like Atlanta and be able to at least start. And even if it is 5 million, he starts, then he can maybe comfortable place. Then he could sign like a two or three year deal worth more money there. Yeah. I mean, good riddance. I never wanted him anyway. So injury prone age, all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. I I did. It doesn't look great for me right now uh, because of the Bud Dupree thing. And I always hate when something like this happens. And I feel like it happens every year that I'll get a lot of my friends and family excited about the potential of the Steelers adding somebody new because they themselves visit or there's a rumor about interest between the two parties out there. And then the player doesn't join the Steelers and I'm left with egg on my face and I have to tell everybody it's all good. And I didn't want him anyway. But I always felt like it was going to be a one-year or a two-year deal. That's not any kind of like newfound knowledge. The two-year deal is uh, what the Steelers were going for. It's what I was hoping Bud would go for, give him a little bit of stability, um, put the Steelers in a position where if he would have signed a two-year deal, they could have potentially used that as leverage in their negotiations with Alex Highsmith saying, hey, um, we still have Bud Dupree for another year, so we don't really have to break the bank on Alex Highsmith assuming Bud Dupree would have had a a decent year as the three here. But if he wanted a better opportunity to go start and maybe springboard himself back into free agency for the next year, you can't fault him for that. Um, It's always so cheesy when people say that you can't be mad at Bud. Well, duh, I'm not mad at Bud. I'm I'm mad at the, uh, the idea of what was 
almost there, how we almost had uh, a really impressive group of three rushing the passer for the Steelers. But unfortunately, uh, this happens a lot in the NFL. Guys sign for money, guys sign for playing opportunities, uh, guys sign because they just want to go closer to home. I don't know where Bud Dupree's from exactly, but all in all, it just means that the Steelers are going to have to look elsewhere for a third edge rusher because right now they truthfully don't have anyone. And you already mentioned they haven't displayed any interest or had any top visits with any of the top edge rushers in the draft. But I think it's safe to assume at this point, especially they're going to be looking to try and get a body in that room somewhere in the third or fourth round that that seems like where they're going to be able to get the most bang for their buck. Um, as far as where the talent level is going to be at that point for edge rusher. Uh, I know they really like, a kid, uh, I think his last name is Williams. This is bad podcasting, but he's uh, <laughs> the edge rusher from Tulane. Yeah. I think they really like Dorian Williams. Is that his name? I think they really like that guy, and he's projected to go third, fourth round. So um, they weren't able to get the veteran presence in Bud Dupree, but they could still get a rookie in here, somebody who, you know, complete opposite and flip side of a veteran, get a young guy in here who also won't have much of a, snap share you won't overload him because tj and highsmith will play a majority of the snaps but if you need a third guy a fresh pair of legs come in pin his ears back and rush the passer that's what a, a rookie can provide you know don't put too much on his plate don't worry about coverage responsibilities just leave that to tj and highsmith and then when one of them needs a blow put the rookie in yeah but i am bummed because i got my head around the idea of bud dupree coming back and I know. you know he chose the falcons who didn't really see that coming but they have Atlanta, they have pieced together a nice little off season and brought in some names. So maybe they're trying to do something uh, in their division because the NFC South is pretty shitty. So it's really wide open. So I, I can see a lot of people looking at the Falcons being like, oh, Bud Dupree just went for money. There's a chance they push for a playoff spot in that division. Oh, yeah, in that division easily. And one of the things I was thinking about, too, is, by the way, Bud is from Macon, Georgia. So uh, it's right up the road. Yeah, may have, grew up, may have grew up an Atlanta Falcons fan. So a lot of folks, you were on the money, man, when saying that. So it's like, it, that's that's a link for sure. Uh, and as far as the edge rushers, I think the official visits they had, uh, Tuli, Tui Pelota, Polo, Pelotu uh, from USC. And he's probably like, um, well, he's definitely going to be a, probably a top 100 pick, I would think. Robert Beal out of Georgia, Felix in uh and DK Uzoma, Kansas State, also, he should be in like that top maybe 75 range, I would think. And then we'll see who else ends up, uh, you know, and they could even maybe find somebody undrafted. Don't forget they brought back Quincy Roche, who they did draft and liked a couple of years ago. Uh, Tuzar Skipper is always around if they need a guy to fill a camp spot. <laughs> so you can bring him in. Uh, doesn't play special teams, apparently. So. Uh, but there's a practice squad player for the ages. Yeah, it is camp phenom if there ever was one. So I, you know, I've got to grill you about guys like you're always you're on the hype train. And this one wasn't on the topics list. This is gonna throw you for a loop. You didn't get to prepare. I don't think you need to prepare for Buda Baker. Like that's <laughs> you're trying to say there's a way to fit that in. Let me tell you what I think about that. If they made that move, Alex Highsmith's gone. Uh, they don't have money for him. I, it's not that I would be against like just totally loading up the secondary. And I think Buddha has played both free and strong safety thus far in his NFL career. So it's, it's not to say that he isn't a fit and they'd be, it'd be two monsters, you know, next yeah, to he's each a other. fit everywhere. Yeah. He's, a, he's a great player. So yeah. he's a fit everywhere and playing with Minka, that would be the dream. And you're right. If they were to bring in Buda Baker, I'd be psyched, obviously. But then you're sacrificing something elsewhere. But that doesn't fall on me. That's not my responsibility to figure that out. So if they were able to get Buda Baker in and not be able to bring back Highsmith, I would assume and hope it's because they've had internal discussions and they realize we still got TJ for X amount of years. Um, we made a habit of drafting another edge rusher. Like we drafted Alex Highsmith while Bud Dupree was on the team and got him to be the the successor so uh if they were to do it naturally there would be other dominoes to fall and sacrifices to make you would just hope that it would all work out 
Yeah, and what I was kind of thinking too was, and I'm going to jump to a different topic and then back to uh, the draft here, but just in the kind of breaking news category was Jalen Hurts. I got to look this up. I have it saved somewhere, so uh, give me a short second as I pull up the, the Twitterverse. Just signed a basically... F you Lamar Jackson type deal. The Ravens are looking at this this morning and saying, what in the hell are we going to do with this? Five years, 255 million contract extension. It makes him the highest paid player in NFL history, according to Ian Rappaport and Tom Pilicero. And uh, agent Nicole Lynn did the deal. Uh, it's the largest deal. <laughs> the funny thing is, is I think uh, Adam Schefter came out and said it was the largest deal ever uh coordinated or orchestrated by a female agent it's like it's the largest deal like he's the highest paid ever man like come on like i understand like the accolades and the giving the credit but i mean uh all, all good for her nicole lynn did the deal it's a hundred almost a uh, it's over a little shy over what 179 million in guarantees plus the eagles first ever no trade clause so they have hitched the saddles to this horse and going forward, we were talking about whether Jalen Hurts could screw this up. I didn't think it was going to happen like now before the draft or anything like that. This Lamar Jackson thing just keeps getting more and more interesting when it comes to the amount of money that they're paying NFL players at the quarterback position. I'm just happy they got kid that the Steelers have Kenny Pickett right now and he's cheap for a few more seasons before he commands this kind of money. Yeah, cherish it. Cherish yeah. these times we have with the cheap franchise quarterback Jalen Hurts I think it's well deserved it's it's hard to imagine a better year than they had last year um aside from actually winning the Super Bowl uh it kind of felt like every week that okay this Jalen Hurts thing it, it has to fall off eventually he has to show some signs of fatigue or teams have to figure him out a little bit but the thing is the difference between him and Lamar Jackson uh is Jalen Hurts doesn't run as much, but when he needs to, he can be as effective. No, he's not as fast, clearly, but he, he's about as close as it gets from a starting quarterback position, and he's got more muscle on his bones. He can take more hits. Um, I think the contract's really well-deserved, and five years, $255 million by a female agent, I, I mean, you could have both parts down there. If you're going to get five years, $255 million, I don't care if you're a man, chick, uh, hermaphrodite, you know, like cat, dog, that, that, that's alien, big time money. Yeah, no matter who you are. Oh, she just got and, paid too, man, because they got their cut. Obviously, the agents get their cut. You know, the percentage. Yeah, yeah, of she's contract, loving so, life, and yeah. the no trade clause that can always be um, that's good for Jalen Hurts, but he has full control over that, as we've seen. Derek Carr had a no trade clause. There's other examples too that if it just runs dry or the team. And the player gets sick of each other, they can get out of that. But Jalen Hurts has full control of that. So yeah, they are showing uh, and demonstrating trust and belief that this last year wasn't a fluke, and Hurts will continue to lead them to successful seasons and playoff seasons. And it's that much better knowing that it really does screw the Ravens. They oh. they now have all eyes on them. Everybody's kind of like standing there with their arms open, like, are you guys gonna? Are you going to pay Lamar or like, what's going on with that? Is he even going to play in this upcoming season? And the longer it takes, the better, because I can't imagine that they, they have this all as figured out and as like things aren't as copacetic and as cool as John Harbaugh and DaCosta and all those idiots over there want you to believe. Like, oh yeah, we love Lamar. This is all about getting Lamar back. If that were the case, he'd already be there. I know there's a difference in between what money he wants and what money they're giving, but we are 10 days and counting from the draft. You can't tell me they're sitting there comfortably uh, knowing what they want in the draft. Their board probably has more eraser marks and more addition marks than a term paper, you know? So um, I'm loving it. I think it's only made matters harder on the Ravens. And the Eagles don't really have any effect on my day-to-day -day life. They're over in the NFC. And um, I don't think that uh, this contract really is a sign that things are going to go up for all quarterbacks. This is uh, another, uh, what's what I'm looking for. This is like a bullet point of the contract. It's not that big of a deal, but people are going to see that money and they're going to worry about every quarterback who's good making that kind of money. I think we just saw if you have a Daniel Jones type of player who has shown that he can lead your team to success in a sense, and he isn't 
like a bad quarterback, you can still find a more reasonable number. But if you have an MVP type candidate, a quarterback who is as good as Jalen Hurts, then yeah, this is the kind of money you'll spend. But it doesn't necessarily wreck the quarterback market, I don't think either. No, it's already wrecked. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, Deshaun Watson, they contributed to it. Um, I, I had to jump back, unfortunately, back to Buddha for a second. Let me pull this back up. Dove Coleman uh, has an update on Buddha Baker. Uh, could be traded for a second or third round pick. Uh, this his source is an NFL uh, executive that spoke with Albert Breer. Adds that give him thirty two. Yeah, give Baker him thirty two. Not wanted give, a new contract. All, offer forty nine first, but keep thirty two in the back pocket. Yeah, I like th that's going to be a big topic to here coming up. That's going to be our next thing. But he adds that Baker not wanted a new contract. His trade value would have been higher. And that brings us to, if you're going to trade anything, Peter King, he's, he's bringing up the bears thing that I was all over. And I know we were talking off the air and I told you that Brian and I put this a little bit on blast. It was more, more a shout out of it, of all these teams. They've talked with each other. It'd be naive to think that they're just picking up the phone with a minute to speak and not know what might be involved. I mean, most of the, there's probably half the league is already probably, uh, been in on this Buda Baker thing. It's probably going to be like one of those draft day type trades or right ahead of it. Oh yeah. I, sure. uh, I remember the Devin Bush trade famously after that went through, I read that, um, the talking heads, you know, uh, at the time it was Kevin Colbert and Omar Khan, Tomlin, they already had a deal in place with the Broncos who they traded with. If so facto the draft fell the way they were imagining, exactly. they already worked out, Hey, we'll trade you 20 for pick 10 and um whatever it was our second round pick the next yeah. year or for i don't remember exactly what it, what it what it was right now but they had that deal worked out in verbal agreement before the draft all that happened when devin bush fell to number 10 is uh kevin colbert picked up the phone called john elway and was like are we still we still good 10 for 20 and and uh the second round pick or whatever it was and they're like yep sounds good click yep. that was it I know there's the Bears smoke, and like I said, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it's like uh, we figured out the Steelers could probably move all the way up to even with the Lions at six, let alone know what else. There's the Raiders, there's the Falcons. They're in the middle there, too, uh, to get into this top ten. And uh, Peter King is saying this just on his own authority or rumor mill. Well, I think Jalen Carter would be a good fit for the Steelers. So, but in order to get him, they would have to be in the top 10. So let's find somebody that they've traded with recently, which is the bears with the chase play pool trade. And let's make this, um, let's make this happen. At least in the rumor mill view. I'm, a, I'm so opposed to this. I'm not opposed to moving up. I'm opposed to giving up 32. I do not want to give up pick 32. This is a very rare occurrence. Steelers have not had three top 50 picks. since 1989 pick 32. It's not pick 33. It should be pick 33, but the Miami Dolphins forfeited it. So this is like even richer by one extra player that's not being taken ahead of it. I'm just, I'm, I'm against that. I do not want to package that pick with 17 for one player. I'd rather give me two players. So and then we're going to be talking about some of the corners and some of the different players that you can have, but people have, it, first it was Paris Johnson. That's who they're going to move up for. They're going to move up for an offensive tackle who, you know, they're at all the big pro days like Ohio state and stuff, but that wasn't one of their official visits. They, they weren't looking at Paris Johnson. They're looking at some other guys uh, who's on the list. Anton Harrison, as of today, Broderick Jones too, which means some of the trackers out there were to try to go through some of the visits or what was scheduled. Somebody has something wrong somewhere and it kind of filters out. And some teams don't even put this information out for anybody. Anyways, the Steelers usually do. So it looks like the Steelers would be over on their visit. So somebody isn't coming in or somebody got canceled or, or something or other. So one of those that was scheduled was Dewan Jones, Ohio state, Anton Harrison, Oklahoma. That was it for the tackles. And now you've got Broderick Jones from Georgia uh, on that list, supposedly coming in today on Monday. So in, in saying all that, I don't, like you got to look at who they're moving up for. Now you're going to say Jalen Carter. If somebody said that anonymously somewhere that reeks to me of national liars month, that is where everyone's trying to throw everyone off their scent. It's making Malik Willis a first round pick. So maybe some sucker takes him instead of Kenny Pickett. And so Kenny Pickett ends up falling to the Steelers at pick 20. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I'm at with this same deal too. I don't know if the Steelers will necessarily move up, but they're gonna, they got to shake off a few of these other teams that have similar interests 
of which we're going to get into with the defensive backs. It seems like a few of them could go maybe just on the fringe of the top 10 or just outside of the top 10, but before pick 17 when the Steelers are on the clock in the first round. Yeah, can I can I believe yeah. the trade smoke okay. without believing the Jalen Carter fire? Yes, because you could. I yeah, so I I do think that you know every year I feel like we'll see smoke screens and lies, but then they also see some truths hidden in between. Where it isn't every year every team gets their own little headline about trading up. They've been talking about teams about trading up. The Steelers don't often get those talks. When they do, we've seen cases like Devin Bush. So. I do believe that the potential of trading up is a realistic thing that the Steelers are discussing both with other teams and inside their own building. Um, it's funny that the bears are linked to them because I know they had a trade not too long ago, but if I was the bears, I wouldn't answer up. I wouldn't answer the Steelers calls <laughs> unless they had my kid and they wanted like to talk about the ransom, you know, cause like with what the Steelers did to the bears in leasing them for Chase Claypool. You know, we all love Chase, but they got the 32nd pick in this year's draft for a guy who I think caught like 10 passes for them since going to Chicago. So there's got to be a little bit of hesitancy and a little bit of weariness from the Bears side in dealing with the Steelers. It's like when you were a kid back in the day and you would trade, you know, uh, a Pokemon card for another card and you traded with an older kid and he convinced you that like, Oh yeah, dude, like the, the basic Squirtle card, it's worth a lot of money here. Just give me your Charizard and I'll give you this card and it'll have longer, longer, good time value. Trust me. That's like what the Steelers did to the bears. So the link I think is just an obvious one that was made because, Oh, we did a trade with them recently. You used to see it with the Eagles a lot, actually, where we'd get, um, linked with the Eagles about potentially making a trade after making the moves for Brandon Boykin and um, a couple other things. If they were to trade up, I don't necessarily think it would be for Jalen Carter. I think it would be for one of the top cornerbacks. Yes. Um, tackle's a possibility, but I was just talking about this with a friend, and I feel stronger about corner because with corner, it seems like there's a there's a definite consensus top two. That's Devin Witherspoon and Christian Gonzalez. Um, you'll search high and low trying to find a mock draft or a projection that doesn't have those two going top 10, particularly Detroit and Atlanta are teams in the top 10 that could use cornerback help. After that, you get in the talk of Joey Porter Jr. versus a guy like Deontay Banks. I've seen the two of them kind of go back and forth as the nationally regarded third best cornerback in the draft. There's a good chance they can get one of them at 17, but if they wanted one of the top two guys, one of the guys where after them, there is a, a there is a fall off in talent and the way the NFL views these guys, um, even Joey Porter Jr. So if they want to go up and get the best of the best and not worry about developing a guy as much, they're going to have to develop him. But Corner is the spot where I think it is warranted and where the value is there. Whereas tackle this year, tackle and cornerback both coincidentally and uniquely always get overdrafted. Their stock gets elevated every year because they're two of the top four most important positions in football. Quarterback, cornerback, left tackle, edge rusher. Guy who throws the ball, guy who protects the guy throwing the ball guy who intercepts the ball, guy who goes after the guy throwing the ball. I just nodding over here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and, but tackle this year is unique where you're seeing mock drafts and you're seeing visits taking place where the top three guys, you've got Broderick Jones, Harris Johnson, right, and Darnell Wright from Tennessee. All three of those guys I've seen at different times make it to 17 for the Steelers. And that could be because this year there aren't as many tackle needy teams in the top 10. There aren't as many tackle needy teams in front of the Steelers that when you look at it that way, it makes the most sense that if they were to trade up in a severe fashion, I'm talking going 17 inside the top 10, I think it would be to get Devin Witherspoon or Christian Gonzalez. That, that would be where I'm laying my money because if you can get one of those two guys, they're coming in right away and they're starting. Sorry, Levi Wallace. If you <laughs> wait and you get a guy like 
Joey Porter Jr., Deontay Banks, Keely Ringo from Georgia, who I've seen them link to. That guy's probably not going to get a whole lot of playing time, at least on defense, for the first few weeks. They're going to take their time with that guy and let him develop. Now, are the Steelers in the position with their secondary to do that, or would they be better off getting a guy who can come in right away and play? I think, naturally, obviously, they get the most value right away and hopefully long term if they were to just trade up and get one of the top two corners. And I don't think it would take pick 32. I know I already said I would trade 32 for Buda Baker. That's different. I wouldn't package it in a trade up for an unknown factor that is a rookie in today's draft. Thank you. Buda, That's where I'm at. There you go. Buda Baker is a proven commodity, a proven all pro. He would be worth the 32nd overall pick. But in order to go from 17 into the top 10, you can find this on NFL like draft websites where you can actually figure out what costs what to go where based off of past year's drafts. And in order to go from 17 to pick number eight or seven, that would take the Steelers first round pick and a pick around 4950, which they have. Yeah. They could bundle pick 17 and pick 49 go up to pick seven or eight, get one of the top two corners, and they still have pick 32. They would still have pick 32, where at that point they could get maybe the fourth best tackle in the draft if he fell, or a linebacker or a receiver. The, if they're able to check off the box of getting an immediate starter right away, they have more flexibility with pick 32. Would you like them to pick a guy who's going to play right away? Of course. But they could use that pick on a guy – like I just mentioned, a guy like Kaylee, Kaylee Ringo or somebody who can develop a little longer. Obviously, they wouldn't take another corner. I'm just using Ringo as an example of a different type of player where if they got a surefire starter in the top 10, then pick 32 wouldn't have to be a surefire starter right away. They could take their time a little bit more with him. So trading up makes sense from a lot of different angles, but it takes two to tango and they would have to find a team willing to trade. I keep saying seven or eight because the Lions pick at six and the Falcons pick at eight. If you want to make sure you get one of those top two corners, I think you got to get to seven or eight. Yeah. Lions. Uh, I had that up by the way. That was, uh, this was the, the most um, up to date chart from draft tech.com. And it was, I don't know why the lions are uh, highlighted on this. That's kind of interesting. It must be something I clicked, but anyways, um, lions at six Raiders at seven, Atlanta at eight and bears at nine. And of course the Steelers at 17 would be like nine fifty, And then the four ten. And if you do any sort of quick math was at 13, something that gets you to about where the bears are, probably gets you to Atlanta. And if you swap anything else as part of that, might get you a little further. Everything you're saying is right where I'm at. And I got to, we got to bring up the current players as to why maybe corner is more important than tackle. So many people are all over Dan Moore Jr. It's not to say they won't take a tackle. I'm, I'm looking at pick 17 and it's like, where are you going to get the most value? Well, they got Roger Jones coming in. If he happens to slip, that could be the direction they go in. But if they go to move yeah, up, if they stay but, at 17, sorry to cut you off. If they yeah. stay at 17, I just want to um, emphasize this point. Then the value is definitely more there for, for, for tackle than it is for trading up. Like I was just trying to explain. Yeah. I think at 17, they have a better chance of getting a good tackle than one of the best corners. Um, but trading up it, it almost, because of that, it almost seems unnecessary if, if they're going after a tackle in the ra first round. Yeah. And, it, and like you were saying, an unproven commodity, when you're making that trade and you could have two unproven commodities, maybe one of which really works out and one doesn't, if you keep 17 and 32, and that's exactly where I, I, I'm more comfortable with that and letting the board play to you, depending on what you could do. If you call up the bears and you can give your seventh round pick just to move up those few six spots, cause they're, they're dumb and they like to give stuff away. Uh, then so be it. Uh, I'm all, I'm down, I'm here for it. You know what I mean? I don't care. That's like giving away Chris Oladokun. I mean, it doesn't matter to me at that point. You're just, you're, you're throwing darts at the board. Uh, in the my, my perfect world trade is to my perfect world trade center w would be, um, in order to trade, they could bundle up 49 and 17, go up, grab a top corner, 32, take whoever. But in that trade in, uh, giving up 49, 17 to get into the top 10, I would love to see uh, the team give us back 
like a late fourth or an early fifth. Yeah. And I think the Steelers are going to try to do something to acquire a pick in that range because um, they don't have a fifth round pick Nothing. or a sixth. And, yeah. and that's a long time to wait between picks. And the Steelers make a lot of their money in the fifth and sixth round. Um, as silly as that sounds. So if they were to trade up, I think they would try to be like, Hey, yeah, we'll give you 17. We'll give you 49, but you guys got to give us your this year's fifth round pick back. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm a hundred percent with you that I'd feel more comfortable with than just giving away picks. It's not to say that a fifth rounder is in the same category as one of those top fifties. And it's kind of uh well, current roster. We were starting to talk about that. The reason why we're thinking maybe corner, uh, I said defensive backs because there's a lot of a lot of folks that were out there that immediately when Terrell Edmonds did not re-sign with the Steelers that were jumping all over the safety train. Got to get a safety, got to get a safety, got to get a safety, got to get a safety. And I'm like, you take a look at not only who's visited, which is uh, it's very sparse when it comes to the visitors that they've had uh, as far as the safeties. We were talking before that these are some later round maybe guys. Daniel Scott, California, Tanner Angle out of NC State. That's about it. That's all they've had. Uh, and it's not a very deep safety class whatsoever. And once you, um, once you get away from, and I'm always confusing banks with, uh, banks and burns and everything like this, this drives me crazy. Um, the, the, the interesting Brian branch, Brian, is on Brian, Brian, Brian branch. That's who I couldn't think. I, his name does not roll off the tongue for me for whatever reason. Oh, Brian branch, Brian from branch, Alabama. Yeah. And that'd be about it. And I don't think he's, I don't know if he's the target at 17. He probably has to be, you probably, he might not get him at 32, but then again, you might, I don't know. He's a bit of a tweener. Yeah. A lot of people have made the, the link to like a Mike Hilton type player. So I don't even know if he, if he projects as a safety at the next level, I, exactly. I've seen, it seems like every other analyst and every other person who gets paid to do this kind of thing they either have him at corner or safety. The next guy flips it. So I don't have a good read on Brian Branch. I think if the Steelers were to take a guy like that, um, it would be not disappointing, but there's always a little bit of uneasiness in my stomach whenever the Steelers take a guy who doesn't have a defined role, like Sean Davis, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, he played corner and safety. Okay, well, is he really good at either one of those? I, I get, sometimes it's about being a master of one of the trades instead of being able to do a bunch of them kind of well. So um, Daniel Scott from Cal, I think he's more of a late round pick uh, for the safety role because uh, mainly he's 25 years old. He went to Cal six years in college. Uh, he's 6'1", 208, runs a 4'4", 5". So he can fly, uh, got a good body, but he's more of a special teams guy at the next level. Um, he can surprise a lot of guys always could, but that visit didn't really move the needle for me. In fact, what it really did was make me think even more that the Steelers aren't looking for an early round safety. They signed Keanu Neal. They still have KZ and obviously Minka Fitzpatrick. That's your top three right now. Yeah. And to Keanu Neal's credit, you know, he had a down year or two, a little bit of a slump with the Cowboys when they wanted him to play out of position and, he had an ACL tear early in his career. But last year with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they they allowed him to play safety more often than not again. And he had a noticeably better season than he did with the Cowboys. So there's a little bit of hope in me that thinks Keanu Neal could be the guy all season long with Casey and obviously Minka. And the way they're doing their pre-draft pre visits and their interviews with players the interest in an early round safety just doesn't seem to be there. And the Steelers are one of those teams where they, they tend to put it all out there. They kind of allow us as fans to follow along and try to take our best guess at what they're, what they're doing. And I, I don't see safety as an early round pick in, in the cards for them right now. Corner. Definitely. Oh safety, yeah. Safety. Not so much. Well, let's talk about that. That's so you've said you're comfortable with Casey being a starter next to Minka. I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally good with it. He was already there for a year. They got to kind of like sneak preview that in case they didn't have Edmonds. Edmonds was only on a one year deal to begin with. And, and I then, think they'll take him yeah. out for packages where they think Neil is better in, you know? Oh, absolutely. Or they're going to add Neil in as an, a, a, one of those three safety looks as well. But you look at the corner side of things, how comfortable are you? Levi Wallace. I mean, he, he created some splash. He got beat here or there. I don't think he's a terrible player, but, uh, Levi Wallace gives them the ability, I think, to 
if they don't get Witherspoon, Gonzalez, or Porter Jr. to an extent, they have the flexibility to take a guy like Keely Ringo, who sends shivers up a lot of people's spines because this guy from Georgia, he's extremely raw. But if you have a secondary that has Patrick Peterson, Levi Wallace, Arthur Mollette in it as your starting three corners, they can bring this guy along slower. It mm-hmm. wouldn't have to be like an Artie Burns thing, get out there right away and get torched. Ringo, he's 6'2", 207. He runs a 4'3". Um, he's got a 33 and a half inch vertical, which I don't really know what's going on there that isn't that good. But the kid was a top 10 high school recruit. He's got great size. He's physical, natural athleticism that you can't really teach. Elite speed. Um, he's good at fighting through blocks, I've noticed, in the run game. Steelers love that in their cornerbacks. But it, there's a lot of negatives, too. He's very raw. Um, when he comes flying in on a run play or on a pass play, he can come in a little out of control. Think Ryan Shazier, but as a corner. Um, there's a lot of tape of him getting beat because – He relies on his speed a little too much at times. Um, He seems to get lost during scramble drills, and he had nine penalties last year. So this guy is not a finished product, but if you could take him and let him sit for half the year or longer, then you've got a way better chance at this guy being a good player. And the current cornerback room the Steelers have, that allows them to take a guy like that. So I want them to take the the guy's – the top one of the top two guys who seem closer to a finished product guys who can play right now but if they don't we don't have to hit the panic button here yeah. because patrick peterson levi wallace and arthur mallette by all accounts should be able to hold it down until this rookie is ready whether they take the kid at 17 or at 32 they wouldn't be they wouldn't be forced into a starting role right away and they wouldn't be they wouldn't have the card stacked again them right away yeah no that's all fair points is uh, can you get your confidence wrecked any more with like position wise i think quarterback and cornerback are like the two that are like just super mental positions oh you yeah do you know you i, I love my receivers but yeah. um you corners like penalty yeah i mean it's 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 tough it's a tough it's a tough position i mean quarterback you got people breathing down your neck you're seeing ghosts but i think you see some of those ghosts too as a corner i mean i always go back to cortez allen they allowed, um, well, they couldn't keep Keenan Lewis. Keenan Lewis played early. He commanded a pretty nice contract. They kind of gave what that contract was going to be to Cortez Allen. They felt they had two guys that could do it. And then Cortez was like in position to make plays and just couldn't make the plays. Like it's just, it was constant. And the cor- the current room, I mean, Pat, let's not kid ourselves. Patrick Peterson's what, like 33 years old? Um, Levi Wallace is still young. Last year of his contract, Akella Witherspoon, I was uh, starting to mention his name kind of unknown because he's had his own injury problems and being on the field and being reliable. Uh, even when, if or not, he is on the field <laughs> when it comes to reliability, reliability, if he's available and then reliability when he's actually out there and playing. And it kind of like that, that's what really precludes me to thinking that DB is a pretty high, uh, spot or a high priority for the Steelers. And we're going to get into right now, some of those top names that have visited, and we kind of already jumped on the safety or corner type deal, but um, we'll we'll go back to that. Why not? I might just skip over that this time since we already discussed it. But because um, there's not a whole lot to bite off there, to be completely honest, like you were just saying, they didn't really talk to a whole lot with the safeties. And but it's if you're in those middle rounds, what are you doing? And we're going to be talking about double dipping too. But as far as the actual pre-draft visitors, you have Joey Porter Jr. from Penn State. You have uh, Christian Gonzalez from Oregon. You have Deontay Banks from Maryland. Julius Brents, we haven't mentioned him yet, Kansas State. Uh, Darius Rush, South Carolina. Tyreek Stevenson, Miami. And then I believe they also had some that were scheduled. Maybe Emmanuel and, uh, Forbes. Emmanuel and Forbes Ringo. was in here too. Uh, so did Forbes officially make it from Ole Miss? Did Forbes I, make it in? I thought so. And then Ringo, we are mentioning from Georgia. Now, Ringo... I don't know that Ringo's a pick 32, though. I mean, that's we're talking about eight corners that the Steelers have talked to. <laughs> eight cornerbacks when it comes to the draft visit. So let's just uh let's just throw this up on the on the board right now. We'll stay with the topics bar. I know you like to stay on topic. With safety or corner, it's almost undoubtedly going to be a corner. Now, my second question to you 
is going to be, um, you know, why don't we just jump from safety to corner? Well, safety or corner. I think we've already answered that, right? We're in agreement. Cornerback yeah. as a priority over safety. We might still have defensive line or an offensive lineman that could be pick 17. So now you got to ask the question, is it going to be um, looking at something in the first or second round? And I think that's what you were really aiming towards is if they move up and they trade up, who's the top dog they're going after? It's got to be Christian Gonzalez. I think so. I think it has to be Gonzalez because he was a visitor, whereas Witherspoon, Devin Witherspoon from Illinois seems to be the consensus one. There's always going to be one or two people who disagree, but Witherspoon is cornerback one of this class. The most common spot I'm seeing him go is to Detroit at six. Um, so I, not to say the Steelers have zero interest, but it'd be very unlike them to trade up for a guy they haven't met with or or gotten a good read on, whereas Gonzalez, it was a bit of a shock he was even a top 30 visit for the Steelers because he's largely considered to be a top 10 lock. So if they were trading up, I think it would be for Gonzalez. He has everything they covet in defensive back. Uh, I'm talking he can play man, he can play off, he can play zone. He uh, has the size, he's got the speed, he's got the turnovers. That's the thing with this class I noticed. A lot of these corners, not all of them, but a lot of them are lacking in the turnover department. And that isn't the end-all be-all for every cornerback or safety prospect, but the Steelers, really ever since Terrell Austin was given the reins, he prioritizes turnovers. And the Steelers led the league in interceptions last year from uh, the defensive backfield. So they found something that works, and I think uh, that can be another point you look to if you're trying to figure out what the Steelers are doing. They want a guy who can get his hands on the football. They are prioritizing ball skills, which I love. And if they were to make a move to go up, it would have to be for a guy who checks all these boxes. I, I'd be shocked if it was for Joey Porter Jr. I I just tend to think that he'll be there at 17 if they want to take him. I also think that it's hard to get an honest read on how the Steelers feel about Joey Porter Jr. because obviously he is who he is. But didn't have a lot of turnovers in college. His visit to the Steelers was unofficial, which that's not his fault that it doesn't count against him because he's a, he's a local kid, but I'm not seeing the link between the two parties as much as like the mainstream media and some Steeler fans want there to be because of the obvious Joey Porter link. So Gonzalez is the target. I think the, the ideal target and then anything after that, you'd be looking at a guy at 17 or 32 who it ranges. The range is pretty wide with 17 and 32 because of the visits they got there, I'd say a good half of them, if not a little bit more, could probably be had at 32. But the draft is a cruel mistress. And if there's a run <laughs> on corners, they might panic. Yeah. They might take a guy too early. So you never know. Like Take a guy like... Deontay Banks, okay, Maryland. He's hard to figure out from a projection standpoint because I've seen him mocked before Joey Porter Jr. I've seen him to the Steelers being mocked at 17. But he doesn't have the turnover numbers. Who knows how important that is to them? And it's really only one or two guys that I've been able to read and keep up with that think Banks is a first round kind of guy. And then there's a guy like Emmanuel Forbes. You can look at who I really like Emmanuel Forbes, as far as what he's put on tape, uh, 14 career picks at Ole Miss. That, can you say turnovers? Like he has that on paper. Yeah, he's a very Forbes smooth nice. athlete. He recognizes route concepts and play designs very fast. Um, he's habitual at using his arm to fight through the receiver's arms once the ball gets there, which is a hard skill to kind of get your mind in the habit of doing, but he's mastered it. Sounds all good, right? This guy should be a top 10 pick, but he's 6'1", 166. So a guy like that, it's it's a hard sell taking a guy in the first round who's under 175 pounds. I now, know. There's, there, and Forbes it's his and, weight. Like, all of these guys are, like, in the six-footer range, give a take an answer. So even uh, Witherspoon's, what, 5'11", 
Like there, there isn't like the. It's not like the a bunch of Julius Brent's is six three. He's like yeah, yeah. Brent has great so size. He's got more Witherspoon size. Witherspoon has like bad size, and that's the one thing that people think if there's going to be a draft day surprise, maybe Gonzalez goes before Witherspoon. I haven't read a whole lot about that, but just getting back to guys like Banks and Forbes, those are two guys that I would hope you could get at 32. Um, taking them at 17 feels like a bit of a stretch. So if they aren't going to trade up and get a guy in the top 10 like Gonzalez, I think 32 is where they would be able to get a guy like Emmanuel Forbes or Deontay Banks or I think that might be a little early for Stevenson from Miami. Honestly, maybe he's more of a third round guy. Yeah. It's that's really interesting to put out there too. And uh, we weren't um, all the way with that uh, as far as, you know, who's, who's our pick or whatever just yet, because there are a lot, the other the other area that just screams attention by the Steelers is defensive line. And they've had a couple tackles. They're the, they're the big names of somebody slides there, you know, but we, we went through this, uh, myself and Brian last week and you have, let's see, Gravon Dexter, Siaka, uh, Aika, Keon White, Keanu Benton. Uh, another visitor was Carl Brooks, Bowling Green. Like the, this, this screams like the day two picks, you know what I mean? Not necessarily yeah. the top guys. It's like Jalen Carter. It's just like they they're not wasting their time. They're not gonna they're trying to get with people that are gonna be their actual targets, not guys that are gonna be gone in the in the top ten. And then everybody's just like, you know, they're they're doing an Leonardo DiCaprio meme and they're pointing at TV. Yeah. Oh no, Jalen Carter, perfect fit for the Steelers. Thank you, Peter King. Um and it's just like I don't know. I don't know that they everybody's need. a perfect fit for the Steelers. I don't Everybody. Think, yeah, that's true. That's true. Especially the way we think without knowing what any of these young men's futures are going to look like. And it's just like one of those things. Like, um, I don't know that they need to visit with Will Anderson or somebody like that to know whether or not they're interested, but usually that kind of precludes the Steelers have visited or had a dinner or something like that with a pro day thing. Well, like, you're nailing it. You're nailing yeah. it. They, they want to schedule visits that are practical Yes, ones with guys that have a chance of being drafted. Look at, I just mentioned Daniel Scott, not too long ago from Cal, the safety. He's not going in the first three rounds. He'll probably oh. go fifth or sixth because of his age and just, but they still had him in for a visit because they want to get a read on him because the Steelers and other good franchises, the draft isn't over in the first three rounds. They, they get talent and they get depth and they get guys who have been proven to make the team and contribute over time in rounds four, five, six, sometimes seven. So they have visits with all these guys, you know, Trey Norwood. They, they want to talk with guys that may not be the top of the class, but that's how it, it, these visits almost mean more. They're almost more of a red flag or not a red flag, but almost more of an indicator being like, hey, this interest is very real because this guy has no business going early in the draft, but the Steelers want to get an inside track on him. Yeah, well, that leaves me to, could they take more than one corner in this draft? Let's say- yeah. Let's say they don't even move up. Let's say the board just plays to them. Joey Porter somehow is there. I, I don't think Gonzalez will be. Or they wait. Let's say they go D-line, and then all of a sudden at 32, it's like a first thing. It's a, Let's say Emmanuel Forbes. Let's even say they could wait till 49 for Forbes, still in the second round, right? I'm not going to say that. Brents, maybe Stevenson into the third or fourth round. Could they take two? Uh, they might. They might. I think the class is like deep enough where you've got the idea of where you were saying there's a, there's a starter or a guy that could start maybe right away and the other guy that could simmer in season or you kind of hold both of them in reserve. I, I just I go back to thinking about the way the Eagles were structured and the way they just, you know, what Chauncey Gardner Johnson, they brought in there and they had Darius Slay and they brought in. Uh, what was it? Was it the guy? from Bradbury. The Yeah, Brad. Giants, right? Yeah. 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 It just, it just keep loading them up and make that secondary as fortified as you can there. So that's going to, it's going to lead me to our last well, little 2016 here. Yeah. 2016, uh, Senquez Golson round two, Duran Grant round four. I'm pretty sure. I know those are bad names, but <laughs> the Steelers tried. have double dipped. They tried, they tried so hard and it's just, oh, it's so painful. I, I think I may have mentioned Duran Grant the other day with Brian. The I mentioned Duran Grant Ohio once State a year University. because he's the poster child now for if you have a guy who got picked in the first four rounds that gets cut before camp. Yeah. And you're an Ohio State guy. <laughs> so I blame you. 
I, I was actually really the excited when there. you picked him. He was one of draft Twitter's like favorites. You know, you follow the draft every year on Twitter as it's happening. And like for all of round three in the beginning of round four, I kept seeing Duran Grant on lists of like best available. So when we took yeah, him off, like, oh yeah, we got two. And then quarters. he had a pick. He had a pick like in his first preseason game too, man. It may have yeah, been a yeah. pick six for all, if I remember. Uh, but it was just like, man, the hype's there. It gets you excited. You know, splash plays. It reminds me of uh, Damone Patterson out of my alma mater, Youngstown State, doing the backflip in the end zone, scoring like two TDs. Uh, he he should have made game. the team. I still say oh, that. Oh man, that guy was dynamite. It's tough. The Steelers wide receivers have just been... It's hard. That's a that's a tough cookie to crack, man, or a tough nut to crack, I should say. So, who's the pick then? Um, if it's seventeen and it's corner, I know we're trying to say maybe they're trying to get the smoke off of Joey Porter Jr. I think that's who it is. I mean, it it, it could be, but if it's not and Porter's gone, Gonzalez is gone. Obviously, Witherspoon. We don't even mention his name because he should be gone. And now you start to kind of think like. And with the double dip too, like that Darius Rush uh, out of South Carolina, that's another guy to look like later on, or if they jump back into one of those later rounds too, because he could be like a five or a six, maybe he could even be a four. I mean, it, it all depends on how this all lays out, but Deontay Banks, I don't know, man. I mean, I feel burned by Maryland players and Mike Tomlin. I just, yeah. it, it's got to be said. It's like saying Ohio State with quarterbacks. I said this with Brian, but Joey Porter, is there anybody you're taking after that? Like at 17, would you take Forbes? They haven't even really looked at Cam Smith. He's another guy that's in this. Tyreek Stevenson and Julius Brent should be further back out there beyond 17. So now you're maybe looking at a defensive lineman. So this is why I don't want to trade up because let's say you got Porter Jr. And then just let's say you got a defensive lineman. Somebody's there. Um, Mazzy Smith out of Michigan or something like that. 32. I'm not saying that's my necessarily pick pick. No, that's a good one. Mock, that's around where I see him but, going. Yeah. But somebody that could be there. Right. Um, Cause Kalijah can't should be gone. They're visiting with Breesy. So if they went Breesy first and then Forbes second, that'd be pretty deep. That'd be pretty damn cool. You never know who's yeah. still floating around from wide receiver land. They've had enough of the wide receiver visits. We talked about all of these guys, but like Jonathan Mingo, Charlie Jones, Jaden Reed, Cedric Tillman out of Tennessee, uh, they had a local visit from uh West Virginia kid, Bryce Ford Wheaton. Well, none of these guys are screaming pick 17 or pick 32, I even think. And Jordan Addison, like he could be gone by 49. He should probably be gone by 49, you would think. Somewhere in the top 50 or in the top 60, somewhere whereabouts. So top 50. I mean, they could still maybe get him, I'm saying, at the very end of that. But uh, I don't know if they pulled the trigger on that. But it would be that would be – I'd be happy with that. I'd be very happy with defensive lineman and corner. You could flip them either way with all of these names that we said. And then if they go and get yet another guy, man, I, uh, I know it's all defense, but they, they put a lot into offense in the draft over the last few years. You know, Najee Harris – Pat Fryermuth, Kenny Pickett, George Pickens, and even going back to Claypool. Uh, most of their investments on the defensive side of the ball have been what since Devin Bush? It's only been like Alex Highsmith, really. And of course, they traded the one in order to get Mika Fitzpatrick, which was a, you know, that's a pretty big deal. So if you are trading 32, 49, or something like that to get Buda Baker and you can fit him in under the money, by all means. You know, that to me, that's 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 a good deal if you can make the business sense of it work there. So um I like Porter. I think they're I think some of the smoke is coming going off of that. Mike Tomlin loves his second generation players. And if he's still on the board, because you know, you, you still like you said, is it Witherspoon? Is it Banks? Is it Gonzalez? Is Porter in those top three of names, or he's probably in those top five for sure. Uh, should be available, should be available. I wouldn't be upset with that. I think corner is the one though, the one position where it's a little more, it's it's heavy. There's a little more talent than some of these other ones where there's like one or two guys. And once those guys are off the board, it's like, ah, I'm not, I'm not really interested. And then that's the way I feel with like offensive tackles. So give me somebody on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy if they take defense, defense, defense with their first three picks, because it would be, I would be operating under the assumption that at least two out of the three of those first three picks, if they're all defense are going to start or contribute heavily on defense in their first year. And I want to help Kenny Pickett as much as possible, but sometimes a really good defense helps a young quarterback as well. Look at big Ben. And so I'm all for loading up the defense, getting the ball back to Kenny as quick as possible, getting the ball to Kenny um, in the red zone, like helping create turnovers, helping put the offense and Kenny 
in good position to score, helping keep teams to a low point total so Kenny doesn't even have to do shit. So I, I am all for <laughs> That's the, great, though. That's Big yeah, Ben. as That's easy big as possible. Ben. I don't. I never hear the arguments from fans being like, oh, Big Ben's first two Super Bowls shouldn't count, especially the first one because of that defense. Team game. It's a team game. Last time I checked, it takes all 32 or all 53. 32 teams, 53 players. So I would be very happy if they took defense, 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 because I would think it meant that they were going by their board and they were going by picking players who they believed would help them win soon, help them win with Kenny Pickett's rookie contract. If they were to move up, I've already said this, I think it would be for Gonzalez. That would be where my money is at. Christian Gonzalez out of Oregon. If they weren't to trade up and they were to just stay at 17, let the draft fall to them. You see, it's funny because that's more stealers of them to just sit back, let the draft fall to them, not gamble with emotions. But it's more Andy Weidel and it's more eagles of a couple years ago to move up and, and get the really talented player and hope that he comes in and is a success as a rookie and then pick the can down the road worry about paying guys when when that time comes hopefully you have to pay the guy because it means he was a good pick but if they were to stay at 17 i think you're looking at joey porter jr like you said um even knowing what i know and what i said about how i don't think the interest is that crazy Sometimes if a guy falls, a guy falls and they do love their bloodlines. They obviously know what this kid's about. So I think Joey Porter Jr. has got a good chance of being the 17th pick. I think Deontay Banks from Maryland, who I'll say, I don't know how excited I would be over that being the first round pick, but I have seen it and I can see it because if they were to take him at 17, he wouldn't have to play right away. They could kind of work him in over time. Tomlin loves his Maryland guys. If not, Joey Porter Jr., if not Deontay Banks, talking strictly corner here, I think Keely Ringo would be that last possibility at 17 because he kind of fits everything I've been saying where, okay, they don't have to trade up, but they get a talented player at 17 of a position of need who does not have to play right away. Um, if Ringo had to play right away, I wouldn't be as, I'm not sold on him, but I wouldn't be as okay with the selection. Cause I have, you know, post-traumatic stress from guys like Artie Burns and guys yeah. who weren't ready to come in and play Ringo, I think would be in a good scenario where he wouldn't have to play. So but at 17, staying at 17, do you, do you I want him be, at 17 though? Like, what? Did, would you, would you be happy with Ringo at 17 over, one of the defensive linemen or say Roger Jones fell there at offensive tackle. I, I'd be kind of pissed. I, I don't think, I don't I'd think they would take there. him over Broderick Jones. No. I think Broderick Jones would have to be the pick about, as a tackle, but I can't speak that in depth of that circumstance, if that makes sense, because yeah. I don't know what, how the board would look at that point. And if they were to take Ringo over a guy like, who'd you just say Broderick Jones, if they took him yeah. over Broderick, be pissed, but I don't, I, I, I would hope Brian, about Brian Breesy. That's a tough one because I'm a Brian <laughs> Breesy fan. I like him from Clemson. I don't know enough about the injuries he's had in college to to really say I would feel better about him at 17 or Ringo at 17. I think both, funny enough, coincidentally, have potential to fall to 32. Yeah. So um, leave my emotions to be boiled at a later time. I'm not sure <laughs> how I would feel off the bat with pick 17 being a guy who can't play right away, but something I could tell myself and sell myself on would be, okay, they took Ringo or they took banks, at least Levi Wallace and Peterson will start the first couple of weeks. Then if one struggles, they can work the kid in, or if the kid has a really good camp, he can play earlier than expected. But I'm just trying to answer who, who I think the picks would be um, yeah. specifically Sorry. naming a cornerback for, for this episode. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, I was just I was just clarifying if you would actually like to have uh Ringo that high or you'd go in another uh, another position. So just to, just to clarify for me if it's like Gonzalez, Porter Jr., I don't know, man. It depends on how they evaluate Forbes. Um that's probably where my cutoff is. I would think Forbes and, is so you know, tricky because and, and of his weird too, weight, you know? Yeah. And uh I love his turnover numbers. I love his 4-3 speed. 
37 and a half inch vert, 10 and a half, 10, 10 foot, 11 inch broad jump. So basically 11 foot broad jump. He can jump out of the gym and he can fly. He can cover with the best of them, but I don't know how a body type like his is going to hold up because he was 166 at the combine. That means he probably tried to put weight on. So it didn't look <laughs> as bad. Probably all water weight too. Yeah. Probably had a leak, take a, you know, sprung a leak a few times, but you no, know, that's kind of what I was getting at too, was with the corners and the double dip kind of idea. It's if the, if they take the third, fourth or fifth corner by pick 17, does that really mean that they're getting the th third, fourth or fifth, like, you know, the value versus looking at the other positions. Yeah. And I, and I think here is, I just think it's another one of those years. They could just sit there and let everyone else be stupid. I was looking at the draft, uh, this trade it value. just makes sense. If you can take a, one of the top three tackles in the draft, which seems realistic or take the fourth or fifth best corner at 17, you take the top three guy. It's, it's simple numbers. I was looking at the chart again, and I was even thinking to myself, would you really want to give up pick 80 and not have a pick in the third round? Not, not have a pick between 49 and 120 to maybe move up to 13 with the Jets just to move up four spots just to get ahead of, say, uh, the Patriots and maybe the Packers. Uh, the Patriots, who, who that's a good call on your part. The Patriots yeah. and the Commanders both uh, have a lot of interest in the corner class I've seen. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, did I say them too? The so New England's at 14, Packers at 15, Commanders at 16, all picking ahead of the Steelers. Those are the ones you got to hold your breath on, depending on which cornerback might be there. We're up against it. It's good stuff, man. I, you know what? I had one more I was going to, um, I was going to mention because it was something else that was more like pressing or breaking news, and I totally forgot what it was going to be. So that, I got that's something. typical for me. I was watching right. the ticker this morning just to give the people a little, I know you and Brian are going to do your mocking mock drafts and I'm not necessarily mocking them right here, but I saw that. No, uh, mock away, mock away. That's why they're <laughs> mock. That's why they're called mocks. <laughs> we, we got Daniel Jeremiah, who I, I largely respect. You know, I think he's one of the best draft minds. Um, proven, former Raven scout, but I won't hold that against him. He has the Steelers going Broderick Jones at 17. Uh, Lance Zerline, who's another talented dude, good writer. I think he even has Steeler fandom in his background. Uh, he has us going with Banks at 17, Deontay Banks. And then I saw Charles Davis, uh, who has kind of faded to the background as of late of draft analysts. He's more of like a color commentator. He gave us Nolan Smith at I 17. Know. That's Think the one with... We just blast. Now that was a blast and not a positive one. <laughs> yeah. They don't really need an edge rusher and Nolan Smith high. is a talented guy, but it isn't like Will Anderson falling to 17. I would be a little, I'd be a little taken back if they took an edge rusher at 17. Um, especially cause it's not a spot where the guy's gonna start. Definitely not. Um, he'll play, but wouldn't be too sold on that. But uh -huh. I do think that Jeremiah and Zerline, they're on to something there. They have us going top tackle or top corner. And that's where I think the Steelers are going to go in the first round. Beautiful, man. That's where I'm headed. We kind of honing in on it. We'll change our mind next week. Uh, it just it jogged my memory. I think I got what I was going to say now. All we've been talking about is trading up. But Banks, Porter's there. Maybe even Bracey's still there. 17. I know some people are like, no, this drafted it. This is all hypothetical. Like even the big boards, they don't know who's going to go where. Alex Leatherwood went at 15 to the Raiders a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah. So anything, anything, anything. In fact, uh, the Patriots took that really obscure offensive lineman that nobody thought was going to go either. And things like this happen. People, you know, and it has to deal with where else they're picking and everything like that. What about trade back? Why aren't the Eagles a trade partner to trade up? Andy Weidel's built right in. Like he knows, you know, those are buddies. They're chums. You know what I mean? That's where he came I'm a, from. I'm a fan Eagles. of trading back, dude. I already kind of trading back. Yeah. I, I Afro like, mentioned the fact that we don't have a fifth round pick and the Steelers probably want to try to acquire one at some point here. I'm all for trading back. The only spot I'd rather them not trade back on, which of course, this is how it works. It would be a really popular time to trade back would be that 32nd pick because I'm going to spend all day waiting for round two to start fantasizing about who we're going to take, who's still on the board. And if it comes out that we traded back, I'll be pissed. 
and like I, I'll <laughs> I'll know it'll be for good value, but I'll be the anticipation will be so built up by that point that if they trade back from 32, that'll suck. But if they have a pick of like five guys at 17 and they bump back to like 25 or something, and they're able to get you know the first round pick and a swap, and maybe pick up to do that, I would I would think they could probably get a a 2023 third to move back like that and uh, maybe a fifth. So I'm all for moving back in the first round, especially if they don't trade up. That sounds stupid and obvious until I explain it (laughs) (laughs) that if they don't trade up and they're they're at 17 and they have a choice of like two or three corners, a D lineman, a tackle, you, you mentioned this. If they have that choice, it only makes sense to move back a couple spots. You'll still get a guy you like get another pick, load up the roster, get out of there. In the inverse, we're li- and you're looking at this, and it's we just mentioned the juggernaut in front of them, Patriots, Packers, Commanders, and now those names are all gone. And now you're thinking you have to kick the tires on Forbes at 17, or let's say the Chargers come calling, pick 21, and there's Jordan Addison or somebody like that's on the board. Smith and Jigba maybe even. And you don't get some of the values that are there. I mean, some of this might even preclude to get you a second rounder, especially if somebody like the Dallas Cowboys come calling, you know, uh, they're down there at 26. Although I don't know that I want to fall behind the Ravens. The Ravens have been looking at wide receiver, like, and they've looking at court, they brought some quarterbacks in too for visits. So there's, a, it's getting spicy and dicey they're looking over, at everything there. over there. They're putting all bay on everything. <laughs> It's it's uh it's pretty crazy, but yeah, I see the Lions, the Bucks, uh, the Seahawks. It could always have some similar inter- interests there uh, as the Steelers, but I mean the 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 Chargers like that at twenty one, Vikings twenty three, the Jaguars at, at twenty four. Hey, speaking of the Seahawks, if anybody's still bad. listening right now and you are questioning my evaluation skills, uh, go back and check my Twitter when day four started last year because. The two names I wanted were Calvin Austin, the, four, the third, or uh, Tariq Woolen. And Tariq Woolen just missed out on Rookie of the Year because Sauce Gardner went crazy. But Tariq Woolen was a pro bowler last year, had like six interceptions, height, weight, speed, nightmare, and uh, I saw that coming. So like receiver, I kind of know what I'm talking about with defensive backs. It's different <laughs> for sure. I mentioned I love my receivers, but I have a little bit of more respect for corners and defensive backs, because I heard a coach say this once, and it's so true, uh, especially when you're doing one-on-ones, the receiver knows where he's going. So he's at a clear advantage at all times. The cornerback, the safety, they don't know where he's going. So an, an ability to diagnose and figure out where a guy is going and match him stride for stride and knock the ball away or intercept it, yeah, I would say I have a little bit of more respect for defensive backs, even though receivers are my sons. <laughs> They're your sons. I'll tell you who else said that. Um, I'm not sure if he's watching or listening somewhere, but uh, uh, I'd say a good uh, follower of SCU that I talk to quite frequently and, and like sort of back channels and stuff like that. And talks a mm-hmm. lot about the draft. I may even post his mock over on Steel City Underground. Uh, Dave, if you're out there listening, LaForest was a big Tariq Woolen guy. He was beating down my door in my ear with a megaphone about this dude. Oh, hell all yeah. Last, all of the the last uh, season. So I'll tip my hat to time there was a game. I, my interest in him was very <laughs> newfound, and it was when the draft was going on. I didn't know about him beforehand. So, Dave, I tip my hat, my man. Yeah, he's got a good nose for the for the DBs. I will say that because he he also was um, a, a big uh, proponent of Chidobi uh, Iwuzie, for years before too. So Dave, you got your shout out there uh, right here at the end of the show. Other big breaking news. We have more quarterback news. Jeff Driscoll just signed a one-year deal with the Arizona Cardinals. Hey, he gave the Steelers (laughs) a run for their money that one year. Oh man. It seems like they all do. Don't they? It's like the backup (laughs) quarterback. The backup quarterbacks is just like the wild West. You don't know what this guy's going to do. You don't know what they're capable of doing. Just ask anybody who had to face Brock Purdy last year, you know? So I think uh, I've brought this up on the show before my family and friends and I have a running joke that like, if the guy is making his first career start or like he was signed off the couch last week, you better believe he's going to break records today versus the Steelers. It'll be a great story about how this guy came in and who saw this coming. Every Steeler fan. 
totally in a totally dumbfounded but it's not exclusive to them though i mean you look at the jets the jets throw in like mike white and he throws like four touchdowns in a game and he hasn't been able to like replicate that since (laughs) yeah Uh, i don't know broken clocks are right twice a day so he cashed uh, in miami yeah yeah he did well my friend thanks for joining us once again and we're we're talking football we're up against it we got to stop at some point so we can get this out to the people before there's some other news. Oh, he's got the black pen today. My bad, dude. You, you know, got me talking draft, and it's kind of like opening you know, up uh, Pandora's box. I got the metal pen. Have what do I got here? I got the white Steelers pens. Ah, here we go. I knew it was in there somewhere. There's the black one. Like I got them all. They're That's all. That's the just one I just threw. Here. Yeah. Well, you don't have it now. <laughs> I know they're all over the floor in here. My girlfriend's like, why are there pens everywhere? That's my sign off, babe. Because it doesn't pick them up. Like, I can't do that, though. We've got the puppy that runs around. She she will chew this thing. Oh, um, yeah. Yep, she's chilling right over here. So, anyway, folks, that'll do it for us. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. My name's Joe. His name is Zach. We are 10 days away. And I can't be any more excited until we can stop arguing about who the pick is and whether or not they're a reach, a bust, be any good. Like, how does this fit? What were they thinking? That's what we'll be talking about in 11 days. But until then, (laughs) my name's Joe Kuzma. His name's Zach Celadonia. And until next time, we encourage everyone out there to be safe, be good. We'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website www.steelcityunderground.com